The 15th of October 1970, a loud crash rang out through all of Melbourne, and this was a collapse of the Westgate Bridge. This was an event that would eventually change the construction industry throughout Australia and leave a scar in the heart of Melbourne. But what you may not know, this was one in a series of bridges that collapsed for nearly a four year period. And they all led down to a similar circumstance of not understanding the structural mechanics behind the design of box girder bridges. I'll be going through the events that led up to the collapse of the Westgate and also go through the other bridges as well and what we can learn from them. So stick there until the end as there will be lessons learned for everyone. My name is Brennan, your structural engineer based in Australia. I know I produce videos around the structural engineering field. So if you do like that type of content, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get into it. What you got to realize, structural engineering is a science. And as per any science, sometimes to push the boundaries, this will lead to some level of failure. And unfortunately, within the structural engineering field, we do not have the luxury to build prototypes and test our design assumptions. So they're tested out in the real world. And sometimes it's found that our design assumptions are lacking. And this is what occurred between 1969 to 1973. This video is not to lay blame on anyone. It's just to lay out the facts so that we can learn from these failures and push forward with the structural engineering field as a better profession as a whole. If you do want to find more information about the causes and really detailed about who was considered to be at fault, you can see that in the Royal Commission report that I'll link below. The Westgate came as the third of the five bridges that collapsed. So let's go back to 1969 and go through the list of the bridges in order. November 1969 in Vienna, Austria, three loud bangs rang out through all the city. As the sun rose and the bridge was inspected, it was found that the bridge had buckled in three places and was hanging kinked in the air. Fortunately, due to the timeless event, there was not anyone injured or killed from this failure. Now let's fast forward seven months later, on the 2nd of June 1970, and it moved into the UK with the bridge under construction over the Lidja Kledal, which suddenly collapsed when a 61 metre free cantilevering area came down. This killed four people. The construction of this bridge was similar to the bridge in Vienna. It was using the freestanding cantilever erection method. Let's fast forward four months to the 15th of October, 1970. And as we move to Melbourne, Australia, at 11.50, the Westgate Bridge collapsed, sadly taking 35 people with us. Out of all the bridges, this was the most tragic with the greatest loss of life. Now we fast forward another 13 months to the 10th of November, 1971. And now we've moved into West Germany with a bridge under the construction of the River Rhine. This bridge too was being constructed using the freestanding candle the rector method when the bottom cord suddenly failed under compression, collapsing into the river causing 13 fatalities. And there was one other bridge that failed in this period of time as well, but it was not known until much later, as it occurred in East Germany in 1973. The failure of this bridge was covered up at the time by the East German government, and it wasn't until the Berlin Wall came out that it was found that this bridge had also failed in a similar method. The Westgate Bridge was third in a series of bridges that collapsed over this time, but unfortunately it was the most tragic with the loss of life of 35 people. This is where our profession of structural engineers paid the greatest price for our misunderstanding. Unfortunately, but true, our design assumptions are tested out in the real world, and at times can lead to catastrophic events as we've seen today. So us as structural engineers need to look back at past failures to make sure they're not forgotten so that these loss of lives are not in vain. We need to ensure that we keep that knowledge and pass it on to make sure that these type of mistakes never happen again. Now, let's get back to the Westgate. The Westgate Bridge started construction in 1968, prior to the first of the series of bridges collapsing. And it did not come with its own challenges. It had many labour strikes and even happened to change the steel fabricator in 1970, who went into receivership. Into 1969, the failure of the Vienna Bridge was only seen as a minor one, as it was only damaged and didn't lead to a total collapse. However, moving forward those seven months to 1970, where the Millhaven Bridge collapsed, this was considered major due to the loss of life and the complete collapse of the structure. What was also to note was the Millhaven Bridge and the Westgate Bridge was built by the same engineering firm, Freeman Fox and Partners. At the time, 
they put out a press release saying that their failure at Millhaven was once in a lifetime event and also pointed out that the construction methodology used on the Millhaven Bridge and the Westgate Bridge were completely different. The Millhaven Bridge was using that freestanding cantilever method, where the Westgate Bridge was lifting up individual parts and joining them together at mid-height, leading to a completely different construction methodology. However, this change in construction methodology had tragic consequences. The construction methodology of the Westgate was essentially to build the two sections of the deck at ground floor into two halves, then lift them up to place. So it allowed them to halve the lifting weight of each section, though doubling the number of lifts required. So essentially what they would do was fully construct each section at ground floor, lift them up to place and then join them together in their final resting position. So we moved into 1969, where the first of the bridges in Vienna failed. As it was only a minor event and no one was injured, not much was considered. However, seven months later, when the Millhaven Bridge collapsed, serious questions were asked. And the Millhaven Bridge and the Westgate Bridge were built by the same engineering firm, Freeman Fox and Partners. At the time, they made a statement saying that the Millhaven Bridge was a once in a lifetime event, and also pointed out that the construction methodologies between the two bridges was different. Despite this, they did lead out additional strengthening works to the Westgate Bridge design before continuing. The change in construction methodology from the freestanding direction method to the method used at the Westgate was what proved to be the fatal flaw in their design. This method of constructing the bridges in two halves led the top free flange to not have enough stiffening capacity. So during one of the lifts on the east section, it actually buckled during the lift. And at the time, instead of dropping it down and fixing it to ground floor, they just decided to proceed with the lift and fix it up at its final resting place. So how did they do this? Well, when it was at its final lifting place, you can see along the bridge, it's connected to a series of seams. And to address the buckle, they, they unbolted a series of these transverse stiffeners to allow the two plates to slide against each other, effectively eliminating the buckle. So by allowing it to unbolt, it allowed the two plates to slide against each other allowing the stress to be relieved and removing the buckle inside the system. That way they could re-drill the bolts and bolt it back up. Now let's move to the west section. As they've previously had a buckling failure, they didn't want that to happen again. So they further strengthened the top cord through adding additional stiffness and diagonal braces from the top free end down to the bottom flange. This effectively restrained the top cord and so during the lift, it did not buckle. However, when they came to join them together, they found there was a misalignment of over 110 mils. Now, they had addressed this earlier on the east section where this did occur, where they allowed hydraulic jacks to push the sections together to allow them to bolt together. With this section being out by so much, the hydraulic jacks were insufficient to close up this gap. So to address this, they decided to put additional weights that essentially weigh it down to allow it to come together so they could join it up. By adding these series of 50 ton blocks to the top of the bridge, it caused the top flange to buckle. This is where they paused for one month to have a discussion between the builders and the engineers on how to affect this issue. After long intense debates for over a month between Freeman Fox and partners and the builder, they decided to go with the method that they did on the E section by unbolting the transverse stiffener plates and allowing them to slide against each other. However, there was one major difference between the west and the east side, was the fact that they added these additional concrete blocks to the top of the section. And the addition of this weight happened to be the fatal flaw. Despite this, this was not known at the time. So on the 15th of October, 1970, they proceeded with the procedure of unbolting this section. And every time they unbolted a bolt, the neutral axis dropped further and further, further increasing the stresses inside the section. So I started off with 10 bolts, it still wasn't enough. 20 bolts, still wasn't enough. 30 bolts, still wasn't enough. They finally got to 37 bolts. This is where there was a loud groan heard throughout the site, followed by a searing of pinging noises as the remaining bolts started to shear off. This is where they broke the back of the bridge and it cracked in half, pulling it off Pier 10, coming down and crashing on the huts below. It tilted up and banged on to Pier 11, knocking over Pier 11. And when the dust settled, 35 lives were lost. After this event, a Royal Commission was set up in Australia 
to find out why this occurred so we can learn the lessons to ensure it never happened again. The study was also done on the other bridges that had collapsed at the time and it was found there was a fundamental misunderstanding of the diaphragm forces and their connections inside the industry that led to a fundamental change throughout the world and design procedures to address this. What made it harder? That each one of these bridges failed in a different way. However, the fundamental misunderstanding was from the same root cause. So this makes it hard for anything that we're looking at. If it was the same method over and over again, it'd be easy to point out what the issue was. However, as each of these bridges had different mechanisms, but ended up pointing towards the same solution, this is what took so much time to work out what was the cause. So let's go through these bridges and how these failures actually occurred. The first of these bridges in Vienna in 1969 occurred when the two free ends were connected. So essentially they cantilevered out both ends of the bridges, finally finishing the construction and joining them together late on the 6th of November. There was another procedure that they were meant to do on that day, and that was lower the intermediate supports. However, due to the time that they'd finished construction, they decided to do this in the morning. This happened to be the fatal mistake that caused the failure of the bridge. As what had happened, it was a hot day and the bridge had expanded. So when they connected it, the bridge was actually longer than where it would have been in its final state. So as the bridge cooled down over the night, the top cord was put further and further into tension. And for it equally even to balance out, this pushed the bottom cord further and further into compression. This was until the bottom cord could no longer take it. And this is where the three loud bangs occurred, where it buckled in three places. Now, let's move forward to Millhaven. And this failure was happening during one of the cantilever free sections was hanging out. And it was fundamentally found that there was a lack of diaphragm stiffness in the top flange. And it was also noted at the time, after the fact, that it was a fundamental misunderstanding within inside the industry and within the practice that the complexity of these diaphragm forces was not fully understood, and it fundamentally led to the rewrite of the design codes throughout the world. And then we only have to move then another four months ahead, then we have the Westgate Bridge collapse. And again, it was for that insufficient stiffener plates. However, this one was even further exacerbated as they unbolted the stiffener plates to fix the buckling procedure. The fourth bridge over the Rizzo Rhine this was slightly different to the two, as it did not happen over a direct support or at a location that was being affected. It happened at an inflection point. However, as an inflection point generally has low stresses, there typically would have been less stiffener plates in this area. It was found that the lack of stiffener plates in this area was the cause of this buckling failure. And then we moved to the final bridge in Germany. Although not known at the time, this too was due to the lack of stiffness, though there's very minimal details on this failure, due to the secrecy of the government that they were under at the time. These events did lead to a Royal Commission in Australia and led to the rewriting of codes globally so that these mistakes will not happen again, and also led to the further strengthening of future bridges that were constructed to ensure that they not suffer the same fatal flaw. When the dust settled, there was over 60 lives lost due to the fundamental misunderstanding of structural engineers. So we need to make sure that we keep looking back to ensure that this is not in vain. And what we can also see from this event, there was not just one single failure potentially that was the cause of the issue. It's normally a series of events. And even as we can see from the Westgate Bridge, the decisions made were made over time and they could have seen previous events where things had worked properly. However, then when it reapplied again, led to a fatal flaw. So as you can see, during the discussion, we need to be highly critical of how we're approaching our designs to ensure we do not have a solid misconception of what actually occurred. While the failure of the Westgate did scar Melbourne for life, it did lead to some good things. It led to the revolutionising of the constructed industry in Australia, Australia, where it focused more on workers' rights. And also within the structural engineering field, it was also a sombering event of the dangers of what we do in this practice to ensure that we do all our best to ensure that we have the best understanding of structural mechanics possible and always applying those lessons whether they be in the past or into the future 
to ensure that our knowledge is always extending. I know this is a sobering video, but I hope you did like it. So do hit the like button as it will help it get out to more people so we may be able to spread the knowledge. And if you do want me to cover anything in more detail, please comment below. I'm more than happy to do so. Anyway, if you haven't subscribed at this point, please do and ding the bell to make sure you get all updates. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.